If so, then let's go on to John Locke, um, uh, um, another major uh, scientist and uh, another major founder of political and social philosophy and theory. I do again what I did with Hobbes. Uh, we'll again do briefly for those who are not interested in lives and history. Uh, so first I introduce you uh, our uh, friend today, John Locke. Uh, he was born in uh, 1642 in Somerset. Uh, his father was uh, a captain in a parliamentary army, a kind of small gentry, uh, uh, not particularly wealthy, but not poor either. Uh, uh, in 52, uh, he went to Oxford, um, and uh, it was noted uh, that uh, he was idle, unhappy, and unremarkable in Oxford. Well, if you do not have a 4.0 at Yale, don't panic, right? You still can be, right, John Locke. There are somebody who blossomed later. He was a late blossomer. Uh, but he, by the end, he was doing well. And, and in fact, uh, he uh, uh, became uh, an uh, official, uh, you know, uh, English universities called teachers officials. Um, officers, even at Yale, you know, we are called officers of Yale Corporation. Uh, kind of, I think, uh, old English tradition. Um, anyway, he was admitted and then in 64, he gave an address uh, to the college. And this is a very important address because this is when he, we can learn the views of young John Locke and quite clear from this address that in fact early in his life he was very traditionalist and quite authoritarian. The kings are uh, good and the people are beasts. So in a way he was Hobbesian. Um, in fact, you know, in the two treaties he stays away discussing Hobbes, but of course the ghost of Hobbes is all over the place, right? Uh, there are actually more seats in here and that's okay too, and so you don't have to sit on the steps. If you want to, that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, uh, a little about the times. Uh, uh, 49, I already mentioned, Charles I was executed. Um, uh, the monarchy was abolished for a time. Oliver Cromwell um, uh, uh, became Lord Protector of England. Uh, um, but uh, though in, he was very popular among many, uh, he really could not control the struggle between the military and the parliament and the chaos uh, what uh, Hobbes experienced um, in the 30s and early 40s, in some ways continued. It was probably not as bad as before, but was still very bad. Well, when Cromwell uh, died, his son uh, tried to become Lord Protector, uh, did not succeed, and finally it was decided to call back Charles I's son, Charles II, to become King of England, so the monarchy was restored. Um, so these were remain turbulent years, and of course, this kind of turbulence uh, does color uh, what uh, 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 Locke stood for. Well, just a picture of Oliver Cromwell for you, um, and then Charles II, uh, who was King of England for. Uh, 25 years. Um, well, there is a New Haven connection to all of this, and uh, not all of you may know that, uh, but I'm sure everybody knows where Whaley Avenue is and where Goff Street is. Well, this has something to do with 
England and John Locke. Uh, two of the judges of the trial of Charles I, Edward Whaley and William Gough, uh, were accused of regicide, and they escaped England in uh, 1660. And uh, they went to Boston. Uh, well, they did the wrong choice, right? They went where Harvard is rather than going where Yale is, okay? Uh, but Boston was an unsafe place, uh, too much under the control uh, of the crown, so therefore they went to the right place, right? And where can it be? Of course, New Haven. So they came to New Haven. And you probably know where West Rock is. Anybody was up on West Rock? Few of them. Well, in West Rock you see a sign which says Judge Cove. So if you go there, there is a little cove, and according to the legends, um, uh, Whaley and Goff hided in this cove. So here you go. Uh, history comes back home. Then they moved actually to Milford and lived in a house there. And I have the picture of this house. I don't swear my life on it that this is really the house in which they hide it. But that's what uh, uh, some historian tells me. OK, but that is a turning point in the life uh, uh, of John Locke in 66, when he meets a formidable person whose name was Anthony Ashley Co uh, Cooper. Uh, well, uh, he was uh, a high aristocrat, but he nevertheless was anti-royalist. He jo joined the parliamentary forces against Charles I, um, and was also a member of the state council uh, during the Republican times. But he supported the restoration of the monarchy in 66, and held very, very high offices between 6060 and 73, including the position of Lord Chancellor. Uh, well, um, uh, he became uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury uh, out of the grace of the king, and usually he's referred to as the Earl of Shaftesbury. Uh, well, in 66, he went to Oxford um, to uh, have a cure for his liver disease. And this is when he met John Locke as a doctor. Um, and uh, John Locke became uh, his physician, and let's put it this way, his friend. Probably a bit of a strong statement because the social status difference was too big to really call it as a friendship. But I will uh, say a word about uh, their uh, relationship. And here is... Uh, um, uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury. Uh, now, uh, in 67, uh, Locke moved to Ashley's house at Exeter House in this trend in London. And I'm sure those of you who visited London know exactly where this trend is. That's still where sort of the legal establishment can be found in London. So he lived there in his household, like, you know, in feudal times. Uh, clients lived with their master's house and ate on the master's table or with other servants' table, even uh, high-ranking people occasionally were not allowed to eat, right, uh, with uh, um, the Lord. Well, he became Ashley's confident advisor and surgeon. He performed a surgery and, I think, medical scientist are still puzzled uh, whether this was some path-breaking surgery or whether uh, he just had good luck uh, uh, that, uh, that it helped uh, uh, um, um, Ashley. Um, Ashley had a, a surplus uh, production of his liver and uh, he implanted a tube into his abdomen area to let this uh, surplus flow out. And certainly Ashley felt much better after the surgery. Well, uh, we know that occasionally the doctors say the surgery was successful and the patient died. Now this was a case when the 
the patient was cured, but we don't know whether the surgery had anything to do with it, right? Uh, but uh, uh, for those of you who are in sciences, this is just a proof that in uh, the 17th century, you know, there was really no distinction yet what sciences are, what philosophy is, and what uh, uh, social sciences are. Was a difference what theology was and the rest of knowledge was. But the rest of the knowledge was all the same, and sort of Locke was also a scientist. 67, he wrote an essay, uh, the essay on toleration, and this is a departure now from Hobbes. This actually advocates uh, 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 the right uh, to dissent. As we have seen, you know, not that Hobbes at all cost would have resisted every dissent, right? You remember we discussed that, that Hobbes also conceded if the king does not deliver, you can transfer your loyalty from the king to another sovereign. But uh, the essay on tolerance does not simply make it as a, such an exceptional case, you know, uh, but it makes, uh, makes a big argument that the right of dissent is an important individual right. He was also then elected in 68 as member of the Royal Society. The Royal Society is like what in the United States we call the American Academy of Sciences. Pretty hard to get into it. Uh, was then and it is now. And 79, um, he was already working on uh, uh, the second treatise. Um, uh, uh, oh, Assumedly to some, I will talk about this. There is some debate when the first treatise and the second treatise were written, and that's not irrelevant, actually, the timing of the two essays. Well, there was, a, uh, on the other hand, a conflict between Charles II and the Parliament and Earl of Shaftesbury, and of course, by implication, John Locke. Uh, Charles II uh, had only illegitimate children. He had quite a few of them, right? Uh, uh, I don't know whether he liked children, but it looks like he liked the technology, at least. <laughs> uh, well, uh, 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 therefore, you know, since the children were all illegitimate, the legitimate heir to the throne was uh, his brother, James. And the only problem with James was that he was Roman Catholic. And we already know from Hobbes that this was a big trouble at that time in Britain. So uh, the Parliament and Shaftesbury himself feared that Roman Catholics will restore their influence and therefore the Parliament's uh, role will be reduced. Uh, um, and then in 73, uh, they, uh, the Parliament was considering a so-called test act. And this is really an ugly act, right? Because test act meant that you have to be tested whether you are Roman Catholic or you belong to the Church of England. And if you are Roman Catholic, then you should not hold certain offices, right? This is just straight discrimination. But, you know, at that time it was kind of defense against the Vatican and the role of the Pope. Uh, well, uh, um, uh, because Shaftesbury's support for this, he was dismissed as Lord Chancellor. Nevertheless, a few years later, uh, the Parliament uh, uh, does pass the Exclusion Bill, and they are supporting uh, James, uh, one of the illegitimate children um, of uh, Charles, uh, as a successor to the throne. Well, um, and this is... Uh, James Stuart, uh, uh, the brother of Charles II, and this is the other James, the Protestant, Shaftesbury's protégé. Well, uh, the Commons passed the law, and Charles II did. He dismissed the Parliament. Uh, uh, well, Shaftesbury was arrested, uh, put into the Tower of London, uh, you probably, if you were in London, you visited the tower or at least had a look at it. Um, and after he was released, he was smarter than to stay in England, who went to a right place. I actually have 
like his days, he went to the Netherlands. Uh, if I had to be exiled, I would prefer to be in Amsterdam, of all places. Uh, OK, uh, um, uh, in uh, 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 83, uh, 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 the VIX, you know, these are the VIX at that time were the kind of the Democratic Party, right? The Tories were the Republican Party, right? And the VIX were the equivalent of the Democratic Party. Well, the VIX were accused to have been involved in a plot to overthrow uh, the king, and some of them were executed. That was the right, right house plot. <coughs> well, Locke was smart enough, he knew he may be next in line. So he also made the right choice. He went to Amsterdam, right? Uh, well, again, I don't swear that this was exactly the house where the plot took place. I'm even not sure whether the plot took place at all or whether this was an invention by the authorities. Uh, well, then there is a revolution in 88, and, and William of Orange uh, becomes the king. Uh, um, uh, well, the problem was that James II did not realize uh, uh, that even the Tories uh, will not support his religious agenda, so he was actually overthrown. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, the Republicans and Democrats, I'm sorry, the Tories and Vicks came together and uh, uh, they invited William uh, uh, to become King of England. And here it is uh, William III and uh, uh, the co-ruler, uh, Queen Mary, uh, 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 his wife, uh, was uh, very much involved in politics and important. And Locke then now can return to England um, and uh, he felt uh, safe in uh, 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 1690 to do so. Well, uh, I will talk about this later. The second treatise may actually uh, be a reflection of the change uh, uh, to the House of Orange, uh, which is a change from absolutism to constitutional monarchy. And therefore, the second treatise can be read as an ideology for a constitutional monarchy rather than absolutism. Whether this is the case, it is being debated. Uh, Locke died in 1704. Interestingly, uh, you know, his uh, major book, uh, The Two Chatties on Government, was published uh, um, uh, in uh, 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 1690, but uh, it was published anonymously. He was concerned enough, uh, even at that time, uh, that uh, 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 he may run into trouble if he publishes this book. Okay, now I will be talking about the, the two chatties and the, and the work now. Oops. Wrong course. Yes, the height course. Yes. So this is the two treaties of government, uh, which actually was appeared in print uh, in uh, 1690, as you can see on the first edition. Now, uh, as I said, there is a debate about it when the first and the second treaties was written. And uh, uh, there are two major Locke scholars, uh, uh, both spent all of their life studying Locke, Peter Laslett uh, uh, suggested that the second treatise was written really first in 1679. It was all engaged in the debates about the exclusion bill, uh, while um, Richard Ashcraft, uh, uh, he was my colleague at UCLA at one point, died unfortunately very young, a brilliant scholar. Uh, Actually, he argued that the second treatise was written uh, in uh, 1683, um, and it is a revolutionary work that this is really the theory of constitutional monarchy, and a kind of popular sovereignty is being formulated for the first time. This is really in 
strong crash, almost absolute negation of, of Hobbes. Well, not quite absolute. We will discuss the, some overlaps between the two arguments. But they both agree that the first treatise was written in 1680. That's un, uh, uncontroversial um, and was published uh, anonymously. So uh, the first treatise. Uh, um, uh, well, uh, I will not speak too much about this. Uh, uh, the second treatise is really the big text uh, everybody reads and cites. But the first treatise uh, takes on a book uh, published by 1680 by Robert Filmer. This looks to, be, to me a very archaic book, but surprisingly, it is still in print. You go on Google and you can buy uh, Robert Filmer's book, Patriarcha. Well, I don't necessarily recommend it uh, because I think this is really archaic and I don't think it got any major contribution beyond challenging Locke to formulate a strong position against. That's, I think, the only reason why you may want to read Patriarcha. Well, uh, he was very much for absolutism and the absolute monarchy. And he advocated, actually, inequality. He said, God set some men above others. And he meant men, right? Men are set ov over women, right? Uh, and uh, older people, like me, are set over younger people, like you, right? And the king over everybody else, right? So this inequality of power is coming from God. God decided that Adam inherits the earth, and then descendants of Adam, the, the sons and grandsons, receive their share of earth, right? So you have to show your family tree, going back to Adam, who received the, the uh, 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 world as a grant, and who was the first king. So the king should trace their family trees back, right, to the first um, person of grace of God. God. Right? So there was a scriptural argument that right? God vested paternal authority in Adam, uh, gave the earth as a grant to him, um, and the monarchical absolute power is inherited this way. There is a descent of the monarchical power. As I said, I see very little right, relevance of this argument, uh, so I, I, but certainly it was important for Locke to have a, a straw man, right? He could face his argument against, um, uh, probably spends too much time, right, um, debating Filmer, and you may have been a bit concerned about these theological controversies and theological arguments in the book, but otherwise, you know, he's really formulating the first big ideas for modern democratic theory. Okay, so uh, uh, now Locke uh, uh, engages uh, uh, Filmer uh, on a number of levels. Um, it actually engages him on the theological level. And he said, well, it's untrue uh, that Adam uh, received the land as grant. It was mankind who received the, the land as a grant from God. Um, and then he mo moves on and he uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, makes uh, a more technical argument. He said, well, even if we assume that it was one single male who received land and all authority, uh, how on earth you can trace your, yourself back to this? This is not a real good way to legitimate somebody. How can Charles II show that you know, he has the ancestry this way? Uh, so that is uh, not the right way to do. And then he said, well, even if it could be done, it would be silly to do that, right? Just because somebody um, is the proper ancestor should not have, should not be the sovereign. What if that person is a jerk, right? Then you really want to have the right people, right, to exercise authority, right? It's a, right, in his time, you know, a very daring argument. Now, let's have a look at the second treatise and uh, the major themes, what he's uh, 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 engaging. Like Hobbes, 
He begins with the statement, we are all born equal and he is free. Free and equal. But as we will see, he draws a very different conclusion than Hobbes did, or by and large different conclusion. And then he does agree with Locke that we need um, uh, a common superior. Uh, a, a suver sovereign, a superior is necessary to avoid um, uh, the state of war. Then he develops a fascinating theory of property, what we have to deal with. Uh, and then he makes uh, this path-breaking argument um, that uh, uh, what we need is a rule by majority. He does not quite identify what the, that majority is, right? This is not popular sovereignty yet, but the idea of rule by majority for the first time is formulated by John Locke. And acceptance of authority can be done only by consent. And what is needed, and this is the very big contribution of Locke, a separation of power, checks and balances, right? This is what is completely missing in Hobbes, and he's making this path-breaking um, uh, argument. So, we are all born free and equal. Let me speak to this a little. Now, what is political power? And he defines these three elements of political power, right? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, the right to make law. There is also execution of law. And there is also politics means uh, the defense of the commonwealth against outside enemies. There are these three functions, right, uh, politics uh, is serving. And this will be very important in his sort of divisions of powers uh, as such. Now, uh, well, if we want to understand where political power, what political power is, we have to see at the origins of political power. And to try to understand why on earth People from the state of nature where they were free and equal move into civil society where they surrender some of their freedom and we'll, we will see will surrender some of their equality. So, uh, what is the origins of this uh, uh, equality? Well, the first argument is very much counter Hobbes, right? Men, all are all made by God, uh, the omnipotent, right? And we are his property, a kind of theological argument. And we are not be, have not been created for the pleasures of one another. So there should not be any man who is a superior, right, by principle. Right? Because we are free, right? The Locke is a liberal, right? Hobbes is a conservative. So what we are experiencing now, right, is the transition of philosophy from conservatism to liberalism, right? And liberalism, of course, will emphasize particularly freedom is the primary uh, 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 value. Uh, and in the state of nature, he said, we were all governed by reason. And I, the, uh, and that actually sort of, because we are all reasonable, we are born reasonable, we are born to be able to be rational, right? And we should be able, right, to understand that we are not supposed to harm each other. You see, this is a very different argument from what, what we have seen uh, 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 on, from Hobbes um, on Tuesday, right? Uh, Hobbes said that we are actually learning morality uh, out by interacting with others who are desiring the same stuff what we do, we are learning it from struggle, right? He does not assume that this comes out of our rationality, that we are reasonable and by nature good. He does assume that we are reasonable, therefore why on earth we should not know that we should respect others? Well, but, and this then is where uh, Locke comes the closest to converge uh, uh, with uh, Hobbes. Well, there is, on the other hand, a danger that there will be a war, 
And uh, in order to avoid war, this is why we will subject ourselves uh, to an authority and leave the state of nature. Uh, uh, but he also makes a claim just to distance himself from Hobbes. He said that's not that the state of nature is necessarily war, right? We have to make a distinction between the state of war and state of nature. Because in the state of nature we are good and reasonable, but nevertheless uh, it, uh, uh, it can turn into a state of war and that's why we will have to join civil society um, and accept uh, an authority. Well, and now comes again a very big difference. So he accepts the danger of war, he lived in times of war, and he accepts that we need an authority because um, of this. Uh, now, uh, but, and, and now it comes the big differences. Well, uh, the lib we, we subject ourselves to uh, authority uh, of others, but this has, be, has to be done by consent, right? Uh, those who are, who are accepting a sovereign have to consent uh, to their uh, subjugation, to authority. Uh, and the, the last citation is also extremely important, right? Freedom of man under government is to have a standing rule of liberty, right? Come on to everyone of that society and made by a legislative power erected in it, right? So the legislative power, now this is the source of sovereign, is somehow in a proper way constituted, right? This was not a problem, really, for uh, Hobbes, not much, right? He could see that there will be simply conferring uh, sovereignty to a single king. Now, Locke is very interested how the sovereign, the source of power to pass legislation is being constituted. And again, he's emphasizing, which was not in Hobbes, but is important, is standing rules to assure liberty, right? Not simply survival, right? Though we know Hobbes had it a more complex way. But liberty is the major issue, uh, what we are uh, uh, seeking for. Well, and then he comes with an interesting idea. Why do we submit ourselves to authority and seek protections for our liberty? Because we want to protect our property. That's the role of the public authority to protect property. It's a very realistic and important assumption. A question in which he and Karl Marx would probably agree. What is the role of the government? to guarantee the sacredness of private property. <laughs> and he has an interesting idea about what property is, where that it is coming from. Very important, this foreshadows Adam Smith in some ways, also foreshadows Karl Marx in another way. Well, he starts with this idea that man had given the world to man in common, and therefore all the fruits belong to each uh, member of the society. It's almost, right, a socialist ideology, right? Um, uh, and uh, he continues along these lines. He said, every man has a property in his own person, right? And uh, the labor of, 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 of what you produce is yours, right? The product of your labor belongs to you. And you will see, this is the first formulation what we will learn from Adam Smith and Karl Marx as a labor theory of value, right? Labor belongs to the laborer, right? Um, uh, as, as such. Uh, uh, because it was created by what is yours, the only thing what certainly is yours, and this is your own body, right? And your laboring capacity. He said, and for this labor being the unquestionable property of the laborer, uh, and then this is a beautiful citation, I just love it, right? Uh, Though the water running in the fountain be everyone's, yet who can doubt but that in the pitcher is his only who drew it out. Bingo, right? 
how crisply in one sentence right, he can capture this wonderful idea that labor creates the value. Right? Wonderfully done. And of course, great influence on Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Well, but there are also limits on private property. Again, he, he almost treats like a socialist. Uh, he said, may anyone engross as much as he will? Uh, to which I answer, not so, right? God has given us all things richly. Uh, well, but how far has he given it to us? To enjoy, right? And whatever is beyond this is more than your share. You have only uh, in your, uh, belongs to you what you can actually enjoy. Nothing what you accumulate. Well, it's a very radical idea. He will backpedal in a minute, right? I will show you how he backpedals out of this very radical idea. But, um, uh, um, now, uh, and the chief matter is, of course, earth. He said it's uh, absolutely obvious, right, that the property belongs to those who can cultivate it, right? As much land as man tills, plants, improves, cultivates, and can use the products of, so much is his property. So the land belongs, it's not, not a notion of private ownership of the land, it's an ownership by the cultivator. And also, let me just point out, while running out of time, uh, there is a very important difference here, right? But the central for, for Locke argument is the abundance. He can make this argument because the primary assumption is that what we desire is available in great abundance to us. We have seen that Hobbes had the opposite idea, right? Uh, we are fighting each other because what we actually desire is a scarce good too many people want, and then we kill each other to get it, right? So there is a scarcity assumption in Hobbes, and there's an abundancy uh, uh, hypothesis in, in Locke. And you have to make up your mind who is appealing to you more. Uh, do you think that the scarcity assumption is a better one, or the abundancy argument is an empirically more appealing one? Well, and then he, as I said, now he backpedals. He knows he's going too far. He said, but God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave them for their benefit, uh, well, uh, he basically did it to the industrious ones. So those who work harder should get more, rather than who does do not work that hard. And then he actually will go um, uh, uh, further. Um, well, labor creates value, right? Uh, and the argument is, right, that everything uh, what has been created as a value has been created uh, by, uh, or almost everything. That's an interesting kind of equation at the end, uh, right? Um, the products of the earth useful to life of man, he said, nine-tenths are the effects of labor. Well, I don't know. You, you can debate certainly where, where, what, what that really means and why on earth he makes the claim. But now and here comes a very big qualification. Did the invention of money, accumulation of property becomes possible, right? And therefore, as uh, accumulation of money occurs, uh, well, uh, then wealth can be hoarded up without injury to anyone. And this becomes, again, very important, right, for liberal the theory. You can't do anything by which you do not injure somebody else, right? What should be prohibited and the government should step in when they sense injury against somebody else, right? Now, uh, now in order to preserve property, you will have to transfer power to the community, to civil society, there are some very important arguments here. It has to be by settled standing rules, right? It has to be written down, has to be agreed upon, and it has to be permanency. There must be a permanency post those rules. You need a predictable environment. Uh, uh, 
and it has to be the same to all parties. You cannot make a, a, a law which applies to the serfs and a law which applies to the nobleman. It has to be the same law for everyone um, uh, 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 as such. Uh, well, um, and this is the origin of uh, uh, legislative and executive power of civil societies. Well, uh, there is a difference between uh, uh, absolute monarchy uh, and uh, constitutional monarchies. He said in an absolute monarchy, you can appeal to the law uh, to restrain violence against you by another subject of the crown. But he said in an absolute monarchy, you cannot really appeal against the king. That's what, you know, in communist societies you could not sue the government, right? Even in Stalinist Russia you could sue your neighbor if, the, if your neighbor did steal something from you. But if the government did steal anything from you, you could not sue the Soviet government, right? What a democratic system means, this is foreshadowed here, if you can sue the government, right? And of course in the United States they can sue the government. Well, you can try it, it will not always work, but uh, good luck. <laughs> well, um, and then he says, uh, this is fun and very, very good. Well, to think that men are so foolish that they care to avoid, but mischiefs can be done to them like your neighbor, polecats or foxes, but are counted not to think of the safety of the war by lions is crazy. Lions are the kings, right? The big authorities. So don't just seek um, laws which protect you against your neighbor. Seek laws which protect you against those in position of authority and power. Uh, right. Uh, and there will, not, will be no civil society unless uh, uh, this uh, uh, happens. Well, he uh, advocates then the principle of rule by the majority, right? Uh, well, what we need, a consent of every individual uh, who made the community uh, in order to create legitimate rule. Um, uh, and once this uh, is uh, uh, arrived at consent, uh, that will bound uh, um, everybody. Uh, uh, um, and uh, one can be subjected to authority only by consent. Uh, well, this consent can be tacit, it's not necessarily always uh, explicit. You are born in the United States, you did not approve, right, the Constitution of the United States. Nevertheless, you have to obey the Constitution of the United States. You have one chance not to do so, uh, you can move to Afghanistan if that's what you prefer, right? So you don't have to go by American law. You can live under Islamic law when you move to a country ruled by Islamic law. Uh, and then the final major contribution, the separation of powers. And he makes a distinction between three types of powers, legislative, executive, and federative powers. That's very different from Montesquieu and different from the American Constitution, right? Where the three branches are legislative, executive, and juridical power. Uh, he makes a claim uh, that the third branch is federative power. Federative power is a defense against outside enemies. And he said, look, what is important that legislative power and executive power has to be separated from each other. Uh, it is absolutism if it is the same person or the same authority which passes the law and which also executes the law. We have to separate those. Um, uh, and, uh, oh. well, I don't have time to go into this. Uh, 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 it's clear enough. Uh, and then there is the kind of federative powers. Uh, as far as the federative powers are concerned, he said, well, the federative powers may not be necessarily uh, separated from the executive branch, it can be actually held by the executive branch as such, as in many ways it is the case, you know, it's very unclear in the United States who actually has these federative powers, right? 
By law, it is the Congress which can declare only laws, uh, wars. But as we have seen, the United States was engaged in a number of major military actions, but commonly we call wars, though the war was never declared, right? And it was the executive branch, right, which de facto uh, declared war and conducts war, uh, occasionally without the consent, occasionally against, right, um, the uh, will uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the House and the Senate. So it's a complex issue, uh, but I think uh, he was quite right that uh, uh, often uh, the federative power and the executive power are the same.